you won't find anything about it on the news or internet. The case was declared closed soon after the crash, claiming that there were no survivors. I never told anyone about it, not even my late wife. I guess the whole thing traumatized me so much that I just wanted to push it to the back of my mind and never think about it again. But it was always there, gnawing at me, reminding me. So now I'm going to tell you all about it. It was early fall and I had just boarded the plane which would take me home from my two week long business trip. The plane took off just to fine and since I'm so prone to jet lag, I decided to get some sleep. I'm not sure how much time had gone by but I remember strong turbulence waking me up. I opened my eyes to see luggage falling down and around and passengers screaming in terror. What's going on? I instantly became alert, asking the terrified lady next to me. She outright ignored me, clutching her seat feverishly. Oxygen masks had dropped from above and I put mine on as soon as it did, buckling my seatbelt with trembling hands. I looked outside the window and saw the tops of endless rows of trees dangerously close and getting closer by the second. This is it. It's all over. Those were my last thoughts before impact and everything went dark. I awoke on the floor of the airplane. Luggage, spilled food, and other items were all around me. I looked up towards the pilot's cabin and was met with a view of trees. The plane had apparently broken into pieces, but the fuse lodge seemed as somewhat intact, despite the mess around me. My first thought was, I survived. Looking down on my aching body and trying to assess the damage, I was pretty bruised up and my shoulder had a minor cut, but other than that, nothing serious. It was then that I heard the voices of other passengers around me. To my left, it sounded like a woman was crying, and another woman was consoling her. In front of me, I heard a moaning sound, while to my right was a man who seemed to be bruised up like me, but fine. I got up and realized that a handful of us were still alive, and some were already checking the dead bodies for their vital signs. We need to help the injured now, one of these survivors shouted. I joined in to help them with that checking the pulses of the passengers that weren't messed up so badly that they could potentially be alive. Linda, she's gone. I'm sorry. The consoling woman told the young girl who was sobbing over what we later figured out was her sister's disfigured body. A few minutes later, we saw a passenger who was alive in a seat, but just barely. He had a metal pipe hanging from his gut and his legs were crushed beyond recognition. He begged us to kill him and after some hesitation, Mitch, one of these survivors, took a hatchet to him. The rest of us turned away. We could hardly bear listening to the sound of the hatchet connecting to the man's skull, let alone watch it. What should we do? Linda asked. Basic rules say that we should stay put, and rescue will have an easier time finding us, I said. Yeah, he's right, another one of these survivors said. We need to set up an SOS signal and try to contact someone. Amber, are you getting anything? He asked the woman who was consoling Linda earlier. She was on her phone trying to see if she could get a signal. Nothing. She shook her head in desperation. Not a single bar. Well, then we have no choice but to wait. Another survivor responded. We have to set up shelter. It's gonna get cold tonight, I said. Wait, we're not gonna be here for that long, are we? Mitch asked. Not tonight and maybe a few more nights, I said. We have to ration our food and get cozy. 
But what about the ones who died? We have to give them a burial. Linda said through tears. We will, sweetie, Amber told her. But right now we have to think about our own survival. We went outside to see where we were. But despite having a small clearing, all around us were tall trees blocking our view. A few broken trees lay around, as a result of the plane knocking them down upon impact. Since there were no major elevations nearby, there was no way of telling how close or far we were from civilization. We carried out the dead bodies and lined them up in front of the plane. We decided not to use our strength for digging, since who knows how long we would have to stay here. So instead, we just covered them with sheets and clothing. In total, there were only six of us left alive. Linda, Amber, Mitch, Will, Norton, and myself. At around dusk, it started to get really cold. So we used the luggage to block the opening in the door as much as we could. Mitch used rocks to form an SOS sign in the small clearing behind the plane in hopes to get the rescuers' attention faster. When night fell, we still couldn't get rid of the impending cold, so we put on extra clothes and huddled up on makeshift beds made from clothing and blankets of other passengers. We ate a meager meal of a candy bar per person and decided to get some sleep. Most of the group members fell asleep quickly, with the exception of Linda crying herself to sleep. I was the last one to fall asleep. I'm not sure what time it was when I suddenly woke up at the sound of a twig snapping outside of the plane. I thought that maybe somebody had found us so I shot up and peered out of the window. I couldn't see anything, so I approached the luggage barricade and peered through the hole. I was met with pitch darkness outside our plane. I had never been camping before. So to see the woods in such absolute blackness, it terrified me. Thinking the sound may have been from an animal, I was about to return to bed when I heard another snap of a twig close by. I grabbed a flashlight and moved some of the luggage away, enough to make an opening for myself. I went outside and scanned the area with a beam of light. Hello? I called out, hoping against hope that something human would hear me. No one was there. I went around the plane with every twig that I stepped on echoing throughout the woods. It was then that I realized how quiet it actually was. When I went to bed, the forest had been brimming with the sounds of its inhabitants. Now there wasn't a single sound. No birds, insects, nothing. I remembered that when a forest goes quiet, it usually means that there's a predator nearby. My heart started racing and I carefully scanned the area with my flashlight again and proceeded to back away towards the plane. I got to the barricade of luggage and as I was about to climb, I heard another sound from behind me. It sounded like something was slowly being dragged across the ground. I pointed my flashlight towards the source of the sound, to the pile of dead bodies. Slowly, I moved the beam from right to left across the still corpses covered by clothes. My flashlight finally reached the edge of the body line on the left, and my heart started thumping even faster. One of the jackets had been moved aside and the space where a body had once been, between two other bodies, was now gone. The dragging sound resounded again. I moved the flashlight up and saw the body of a woman lying on the floor, and then it limply slid further into darkness by a few inches, with that same dragging sound, leaving only her legs hanging in the light. I pointed the flashlight further upwards, and saw the woman's wide eyes staring blankly towards the sky, with an expressionless face. But that's not what scared me. And clasping the woman's hair just at the edge of the light was a skinny yet muscular black hairy hand. Two glowing eyes reflected back from the flashlight 
and as soon as the creature saw me, it produced a very short scream. We're talking like milliseconds here. It ran off with the sound of loud and impossibly quick footsteps, echoing and at the same time fading almost instantly, dragging the woman behind itself into the darkness. I dropped the flashlight and ran back to the plane. I blocked the opening with the luggage, panting. I returned to my seat, surprised that nobody was awake by my loud footsteps and breathing. I covered myself, keeping an eye on the luggage barricade. All night I thought that I imagined skinny hands poking their way in, but whenever I blinked, they were gone. Sometime before dawn I finally fell asleep. I awoke to the chirping of the birds and the voices outside of the plane. I sighed in relief, the nightmare still freshly imprinted in my mind. I went outside and saw Norton and Will standing near the pile of bodies and having a heated discussion. I approached them to ask what they were talking about and Norton said, One of the dead passengers is missing. It might have been a bear. I looked past them towards the corpses and saw the space where one of the dead bodies should have been. And beyond that, distinctive tracks of something heavy being dragged in the ground stretched and disappeared in the tree line ahead. I knew what I saw the first night outside the plane wreck made no logical sense, so I went along with Will and Norton's theory that it was a bear that had dragged the body away, opting not to tell them that I saw something suspicious. I assumed that I was in shock from the plane crash and saw something that shouldn't have been there. On day two, when everybody woke up, we gathered up in front of the plane and started making plans. We had enough food to last us for three days at most if we rationed it, but we assumed that we might be stuck much longer than that. It was a long flight and the area that we were stuck in was huge, so rescue was expected to be slow. Amber tried getting a signal on her phone again before her battery had died but no dice. I told her to keep her phone off until we would find a more elevated area. On that note, Mitch decided to gather wood, while Norton prepared traps for rabbits or any other animals that we could find. Will's job was to move the bodies further away from the plane in order to prevent the bear from coming near us again. My job was to try to find a hill to climb or anything that could potentially lead us to our freedom. Mitch told me not to go too far away under any circumstances, and he gave me a lipstick to mark the trees, not to get lost. I put on a backpack and took a power bar and a bottled water with me, and I started heading in one direction. I wanted to bring a knife, but the only thing we had was the hatchet which we assumed came with the plane for breaking down doors and emergencies, and the others needed it for chopping wood. And besides, if a bear attacks you, we'll lose you and we'll lose the hatchet, Mitch said. Now remember, Norton said as he escorted me out of our shelter, if you run into a bear, just play dead. He may toss you around, but as long as you don't move, you should be fine. Now, if it's a grizzly, I know. Shout at him until he gets offended and runs away, I said. And assume a high power posture. You want him to feel threatened. How do I know if it's a bear or a grizzly, I asked. Grizzlies have a hump on their shoulder, I think. You think? I raised my eyebrows. Look, as long as you go on shouting, the bear will know to avoid you. How do you know that? I watched it on that survival show with Bear Grylls. Oh, and don't run. Bears will see you as prey if you run and then you're screwed. I went my own way while the others attended to their business. As I went on, I would occasionally shout phrases like, Hey, or hello, to scare off any potential bears. I used lipstick to mark the trees that I passed by with an axe every 10 and 20 steps or so. 
The terrain was uneven and I almost twisted my ankle a few times so by the time an hour had passed, I realized that I probably hadn't gotten too far from the camp. All the while I ran into slopes here and there, but no major hills or anything, so I reckoned that we would have to climb one of the trees to get a good view of the area. I turned back and started to retrace my steps, since I figured that I would need some time to get back. I followed the trees which I marked for about half an hour, until I reached a tree which made me stop dead in my tracks. The X which I had marked on the tree was visibly smudged. Now it could have been a squirrel or something. I know, but this was different. The smudge went down from the X in three even lines as if somebody had drawn their fingers across the tree bark. I held my breath as I checked out my surroundings and I suddenly became aware of the stupid, stupid mistake that I had made once more. I didn't pay attention to the sounds and the forest had gone silent during my walk when I wasn't listening. I suddenly felt like I was being watched. I didn't know if I should shout to chase the potential bear away or be quiet to avoid drawing attention, because something told me what I was dealing with here was not a regular forest predator. I opted for the second option, and silently proceeded back towards the camp, painfully aware of every leaf crunching under my feet. I kept looking over my shoulder every now and again, always afraid that I would be met face to face with something incomprehensible. The further I went though, the quieter that it got around me. I felt like I was walking straight into the predator's arms, and then I heard something which made me stop. As I stepped on a crunching leaf, I heard a crunch a hundred feet behind me. I wasn't sure if it was an echo or my imagination, but I shot around nonetheless and quickly scanned the area. Nothing was there. So then why did the hair in the back of my neck stand straight, and I felt such primordial fear? I slowly scanned the trees again and stopped on one of them. Something was off about this one tree. And then my scream caught up my throat when I realized what I was staring at was a black figure peeking from behind the tree. It wasn't moving and it was staring directly at me with one hand held around the side of the tree. It stared at me as if I wasn't aware of it and it was stalking me. I stared at it in silence for a while and it stared back, neither of us moving. I almost convinced myself that it was my imagination, like the way you see your pile of clothes on your chair in the middle of the night. But then its hand moved slightly down across the tree. I couldn't tell due to the distance, but one thing was for sure, that was no bear. I turned around and started running, not caring about the rules that Norton told me. Forget the rules, forget finding any elevation. I just ran as quickly as I could to find safety. After what felt like ages, I started hearing the voices of my fellow survivors in the distance and these sounds of the forest came back to life. I soon saw the playing group gathered around a campfire. I ran to them and turned around to see if I was being followed, but nothing was there. You okay, Sam? Amber asked. There's something out there, I said panting not taking my eyes off the direction that I had just come from. Everyone was confused and when I explained to them what I saw just now and the night before, some of them became visibly worried. We agreed not to leave camp and Mitch suggested to make a barricade around in order to prevent dangerous animals from wandering in. Each survivor was to carry something for defense. However, since everybody was short of weapons save for Mitch, who claimed the hatchet for himself, the others got makeshift spears from wood. No one believed my description of the creature that I saw. Heck, even I wasn't sure what I saw, but they all agreed that it wasn't safe to go alone. 
After lunch, we gathered up some more wood for the fire and tried to pass the time by talking to each other. Amber was a businesswoman who was on a trip like me. She used to be married, but work came first for her. Elinda was having the hardest time of us all, having witnessed her sister's death in the crash. The two of them were on vacation when it all happened. She racked her mind about how her parents would react, but Amber comforted her most of the time. Mitch was an athlete who had a knee injury, so he was visiting his physiotherapist in the country. He considered himself lucky to even come out alive, let alone avoid more severe injuries in the crash. Will was a programmer and that's all we managed to get out of him, while Norton was an assistant professor. Like Linda, he was also on vacation. It got dark and cold pretty soon despite only being around 5 p.m., so we decided that it was time to get back inside the airplane. Will insisted on staying outside and keeping the fire going, since it greatly improved our odds of being found. Although I didn't feel happy about him staying out there alone, I knew that he was right and I sure as heck didn't want to be the one to stay out there. At around 8 p.m., Mitch Norton and I joined him outside to keep him company. He had started building a makeshift fence by then, and big sturdy branches were already sticking out of the ground in various places around the camp. And when I'm done here, this camp will be enough to last us through the entire winter, Will proudly said. Well, let's hope we don't have to stay here for so long, I replied. Norton went to take a leak. You think they'll find us soon? Will asked. It shouldn't be more than ten days, Mitch replied. This didn't seem to lift Will's spirits. Norton was done taking a leak so he zipped up his pants. Well, one thing's for sure, he said as he turned around towards us. At least we're spending some time away from technology. Will poked the burning wood while Mitch stared at the fire. The fire cracked violently for a moment, illuminating Norton's face in the area around him. In that split second, I saw something black and hairy behind him, slowly creeping up on all fours, before it merged with the darkness again. It was the same creature from before. It was on all fours, right behind Norton. I opened my mouth and tried to scream, but no sound came out. It all happened so fast. Norton's jovial expression turned into one of surprise as he got yanked backwards, and his sudden screaming mixed with the sound of dragging faded only moments later, as if he somehow managed to run a hundred yards in mere seconds. Everybody else instantly became alert. Uh, Norton? Mitch stood up. Norton! Norton's now barely audible screams faded completely and the only sound remaining was the crackling of fire. Norton! Mitch shouted again, only getting his echo as a response. Sam, what happened? It... it just took him. I barely uttered. What took him? Mitch asked. And then a scream came through, which froze my bone to the marrow. It sounded like screeching tires which echoed throughout the woods and all the way to our camp. We gotta get back inside now, I shouted. Wait, we gotta go help Norton, Mitch said. Mitch, think about it. If we go out there now, we're as good as dead. We gotta get back to the plane right now. All three of us ran back to the plane and barricaded it back with the luggage. The two girls were confused and distressed, asking where Norton was and what that inhuman scream was. But we had no time to explain. Listen, we need to be as quiet as possible. We don't know what's going on, but some dangerous animal is out there, Mitch said. And we sat for what felt like hours, long after the flame had died down. Everybody was slumped down in the plane seats, clutching their spears. I started to get sleepy, when a noise came from outside the plane. The snap of a twig. Shh. Mitch said, lying across these seats with the hatchet held tightly to his chest. 
A sound of scratching came from my side of the plane and I froze in place. A moment later, it stopped. I heard something that sounded like sniffing followed by the sound of footsteps upon leaves which faded away. I gathered the courage to lift my head just enough to peek through the window. At first I saw nothing, and then through the darkness I saw movement. A tall, hunched over figure was standing where the bodies had been moved. It bent down to inspect them before grabbing one with its abnormally long arm and dragging it away into the darkness, just like it did with the woman the night before. And we got no sleep until sunrise. On the early morning of day three, the chirping of the birds returned. That's how we knew it was safe to go back outside. Despite that, we were still extremely paranoid when going out, and so we carefully observed the surrounding first. Okay, I think it's gone. Mitch shouted to the rest of us. We followed him outside. Mitch turned to me with heavy bags under his eyes and asked, Sam, what the heck is that thing? I saw it a few times by now, but I never managed to get a good look at it. I shook my head. Well, did you see it? Mitch turned to Will. I didn't even see what happened to Norton until I heard the screaming, Will said. And we stood in silence for a while. We can't stay here anymore, Linda said. While we can't go wandering around the woods with that thing stalking us there, we'll be sitting ducks, Mitch responded. So what then? Amber interjected. I looked around and thought for a moment. I knew what the right thing to do was, but I hated the idea every bit anyway. We have to rescue Norton, I finally said. We can't leave him behind. Whoa now, Mitch raised his hand. I didn't see it very well, but that creature looked pretty dangerous to me. We can't try to go against it. Yeah, not to mention how fast it is. Norton's screams were here one moment and then, Will said. I think we're going to be safe if we bring torches, I said. The creature, whatever it is, stalked me from afar yesterday morning, and it was in our camp the night before, but it never approached while there was a fire going. And when I pointed my flashlight at it, it scurried away with the body of the passenger. It's a long shot, I know, but it's worth a try. Okay, but how the heck do we find Norton? He could be anywhere. For all we know, he could be dead. I pointed to the pile of dead bodies and said, Last night it dragged another body away. It's always dragging them in the same direction. I think that it might have a place where it stays. If we follow the tracks, we might be able to find it. Again, did you see how fast it is? Wool said. It could take us days to find it, if we even find it. Well, while it's alive, none of us are safe here, I said. We've got enough water, but food will run out soon. We have to start thinking of alternatives. Yeah, the creature probably needs water, right? Amber asked. There might be a creek nearby, and if there is, following it will get us out of the woods. We spent some time discussing it, and in the end, we came to the conclusion that we would make some torches, stock up on food, and follow its trail. We packed everything useful and made torches by cutting a few branches and wrapping them in cloth. We had no oil or fuel to make the flames last longer, so we figured we would just need the torches to last us long enough to ward off the beast, should we come face to face with it. The thought of anger in that thing filled me with unspeakable fear, but also defiant satisfaction. One way or another, this would all be over soon. We inspected the place where Norton had been kidnapped, and it quickly became apparent that the tracks where he had been dragged in the ground were either clear of leaves or there was an obvious sign of leaves being flattened in places. If we wait too long and more leaves fall, We'll lose the trail. We have to go now, Will said as he picked up a leaf, inspecting it curiously. 
The rest of us agreed and we let Will take the lead, since he seemed to have the best eye in figuring where to go whenever we lost the trail. Only a few hundred yards away we saw two tracks merging into one, and it didn't take us long to figure out that one was Norton, and the other was from the body the creature had dragged off last night. It made it all the more easy for us since the trail became a lot clearer. It also fortified Amber's theory that it had a layer, since the creature seemed to always move on the same path. We walked for about 30 minutes before we saw a blue piece of fabric on a nearby log. Will quickly bent down to inspect it. I think this is Norton's, he said. He was wearing blue pants. Uh, this isn't good. Why not? Linda asked. I think there's blood on it. He raised the fabric for everybody to see. Linda gasped and Mitch inhaled through his teeth. Now don't worry, it doesn't look like he was injured badly, but we better hurry, Will said. We went on for an hour before running into something completely unexpected off trail. A big piece of metal. We looked past it and saw more tiny pieces scattered around. Look! Mitch pointed at a tiny clearing and then the rest of us saw it too. What was left of the pilot's cockpit was woefully sitting in the clearing, partially facing down with its nose. There might be something that we could use there, I said. We approached the cockpit and immediately saw the body of one of the pilots. He was sitting in the chair in front of the cracked windshield, head slumped backwards. His abdomen was covered in blood, but we weren't sure whether the crash or something else had killed him. Mitch saw an open first aid kit and although some of the contents were used up, we took it just to be on the safe side. I glanced to the floor and saw a small device that looked like an mp3 player of sorts, next to a flare gun. I knelt down and reached out to it, when a freezing hand grabbed my wrist. I looked up at the pilot, who previously had his eyes shut and now stared at me wide-eyed. You have to run, he spoke with a trembling voice. Get out of here before it returns. I pulled back in horror, pulling the pilot off the chair along with me. He stumbled down like a rag doll and ceased moving altogether. Oh my god. Linda clasped her mouth with her hands. Mitch approached the pilot and checked his pulse. He's dead, he said confused. I picked up the flare gun and device which were on the ground. The gun had a round in it so I put it in my pocket and pressed the play button on the device. A voice started speaking through it. This is Captain Miles. Our plane crashed less than an hour ago. My co-pilot and I are miraculously alive, but we don't know where the passengers are since the plane broke into pieces. We still don't know what went wrong. We contacted control, but there was no response. We'll stay here and wait for rescue. We don't have much food or water left, so we'll make do with what we have. There was a pause before the voice started speaking again. This is Captain Miles. Ten hours have passed since the crash. We saw somebody moving in the distance a while ago, but whoever it was, they ran away. If we're lucky, it's one of the locals and we aren't far from civilization. Another pause and then... This is Captain Miles. It's been roughly a day since the crash. We keep seeing someone in the distance always hiding behind trees. Whenever we shout for the person and ask for help, they run away. My coworker says that it's a bear since he got a closer look. Just in case we're keeping our flare gun close by and we'll continue having a campfire to stave off any potential predators. A short pause and then the captain's panting was heard. He said in a panic. Holy crap. This is Captain Miles, that is no bear. I didn't manage to get a good look at it, but when I heard my co-pilot screaming, I turned around and saw him getting dragged away by this, this hairy thing. I tried to follow them, but it was too fast and it's dark, and I had to go back to the cockpit. 
I'm staying here until morning and then I'm getting the heck out of here. Another pause, at this time longer. I thought the recording was over, but then Miles continued. This is Captain Miles. I tried running away, but this thing keeps toying with me. Wherever I go, it's there, just peeking behind the trees, pretending to hide. But I think it wanted me to see it. It knew what it was doing, because by noon, I had taken so many reroutes that I was back at the plane and the creature was gone. I'll have to stay here and defend myself if it attacks. Another pause before Miles' shallow panting can be heard again. He said, It got me. It freaking got me. But I managed to wound it before it could finish me off. Shot two flares and managed to take a few of its fingers with the first one. The second flare only scared it away. It seems to be afraid of unnatural lights and fire. This thing is really smart. It scouts during the day and attacks during the night. There is a growl from the recorder. Linda cradled her arms looking over her shoulder as if she expected the creature to appear right then behind her. The pilot continued. It's close now watching me. I can see it just beyond the fire. It won't come close as long as the fire is going, but I'm almost out of wood. I hope it can last until morning, but if it doesn't, I have one more flare remaining. I may not kill it, but I sure as heck will do a number on it before it takes me. If anyone finds this, don't wait for rescue. Kill the creature. Don't try running away because it will always follow. It knows this forest better than anything living in it. As for me, I'm not going to survive my wounds either way. Captain Miles out. The recording stopped. We listened in silence and horror. Jesus Christ, Mitch said in a trembling voice. And while that does it, I said, we have to kill it. Did you even hear what the pilot said? Mitch snapped. He fired a flare at it and it's still alive. Yeah, but we can't leave until it's dead. Don't you get it? It will never let us leave the forest alive, so it's either us or it. I'm not going to fight with that thing at first. All we have is this hatchet and there's no way. Wait. Woe raised his hand and interrupted Mitch. Where's Amber? We shot around and gave Linda, who was standing at the back, an accusatory look. She was here just a moment ago, she said. Amber, where are you? Will shouted. And then we all saw it and it made our hearts sink to the floor. Blood. A trail of blood went along the clearing and into the tree line. Oh God, we have to go find her, Linda said. Mitch took point and started following the trail, calling Amber's name along the way. It was evident that she had lost a lot of blood and was in the best case scenario badly wounded. The trail of blood started to thin out pretty soon, but since it merged with the tracks we followed prior to that, it wasn't very difficult to stay in the right path. How could you even let this happen, Linda? Mitch shouted in frustration. Why are you blaming me for this? Linda defended herself. You were right next to her, Mitch rebutted. Mitch, back off, it wasn't her fault, I said. We continued striding in silence. Hey guys, wait up. Will shouted from the back, barely able to keep up with Mitch, who was practically jogging now. No, come on, we have to hurry. Mitch shouted back before stopping dead in his tracks, making me bump into him. What the heck, Mitch? I shouted. And then I realized why he had stopped. In front of us was a cliff, and carved into it was a narrow passage into a cave. The passage itself was obscured by branches so it could be easily missed, even walking right next to it. The tracks of blood led inside and disappeared in the darkness of the cave. This must be the lair. Mitch muttered and turned to the rest of us. You guys ready? No one responded. Mitch whipped out his lighter and lit his own torch and then ours and went in without a moment of hesitation. I remember watching him and his flame get consumed by the darkness and admiring him, wondering if he was courageous or just foolish. 
The rest of us followed into what I expected would be a small cave, turned out to be a complex combination of tunnel after tunnel. The passages were barely wide enough for even one of us to go through, so we went in a row, Mitch in front, then Will, then me, and then Linda. Oh Jesus. Mitch stopped again and looked at a particular spot on the ground. What is it? I asked. He simply continued walking and said, Come on, let's move. As I walked past what he was looking at on the ground, my torch illuminated enough for me to realize that I was looking at a human hand. A feminine, blood-curdling scream suddenly came from the cave, somewhere in the distance. Amber! Mitch shouted again and started running. I followed him and Will closely behind, clutching the torch in one hand and the flare gun in the other. The screams continued as if somebody was being flayed alive, but it was impossible to tell which direction they were coming from. Mitch and Will rounded the corner and their flames disappeared out of sight, so I hurried after them, yelling at them to slow down. The ground was uneven and slippery and I could barely see in front of myself. Another scream echoed. I turned around and realized that Linda was gone. Linda, are you there? I asked, but no response came through. There was a low growl coming from the darkness in front of me reverberating on the walls all around me. I started running back in the direction of Mitch and Will, completely forgetting about the flare gun in my panic state. I couldn't see where my companion's torch flames were, and when I reached a forking in the passages, I panicked even more. With the inhuman scream following closely behind me, I rushed to the left, now full-on sprinting unsteadily. I kept a losing balance due to the uneven ground but I kept running for dear life, not caring where I was going. I just wanted to be as far away from that creature as possible. And then I felt the ground disappear from beneath my feet and I stumbled forward, falling down somewhere and hitting my head. Everything went dark after that. I woke up with a throbbing head. It was pitch black in front of me as I felt my way around the ground with my hands. I felt pebbles and rocks shifting and sliding. I no longer had my torch, however, the flare gun was still in my pocket. The screams that followed me previously were gone now, leaving me only with the sound of my own heavy panting. I didn't dare call out to my fellow survivors under fear of attracting something far worse. I still had my backpack on so I reached into it and felt around until I found the lighter. I steadied myself on the pebbles that kept sliding from underneath me, and flicked it once. Immediately, the flames sparked to life. I gasped in terror at the sight before me. Those weren't pebbles, but instead human bones. Hundreds, no thousands of them on one big pile, covered in dry blood and dirt. I screamed and fell backwards. The light on my lighter disappearing instantly. I scooted back until my back hit the wall, hyperventilating. I flicked the lighter once more as soon as I was calmer and observed my surroundings. Bones were everywhere and I saw no way out, but there had to be one. I stood up and unsteadily walked across the giant tomb balancing myself on both legs in one hand, while holding the lighter with the other. The cave seemed to lead forward, so I followed the only remaining passage, hoping that it wouldn't end with a dead end. There was a crack in the wall ahead, big enough for me to go through, and I heard the sound of water somewhere in the distance. With rekindled hope, I followed the sound, cursing at myself for allowing me to get into this situation. I wondered where Linda, Will, and Mitch were, but I was also too preoccupied with claustrophobia and fear of being eaten alive to worry too much about them. And then I felt myself step into a puddle of water. 
I illuminated the ground and realized that I was standing in a creek, which led to a tiny area contrasting the pitch of darkness all around me. I hurried up, splashing my way through and breathing so loudly that my voice echoed throughout the cave. But then I remembered that I should probably be more quiet. The sound of water was getting louder and when I finally reached the semi-illuminated part of the cave, I was in a more open area with a crack on the ceiling, letting in a faint beam of moonlight. I thank God for getting me out of the narrow tunnels, but my relief was short-lived when I heard a crunch echo from my left. I turned my head to the source of the sound slowly and saw movement in the distance. As my eyes adjusted, I saw a black figure hunched over, facing away from me. My heart started to race because I realized there was no way that that sort of shape could be one belonging to a human being. It was eating something and I dreaded to think what its meal was. I immediately flicked my lighter off and as I stood there, frozen in place, I looked around and realized that the only way out was in the direction of the creature. At first I thought that there's no way I would try to get past it, but then I remembered that the only other way was to go back to the lair filled with bones. I mustered my courage put the flare gun into my hand and slowly began towards the opening where the creature was. With each crunch it made, my heart jumped just a little bit. As I got closer, the creature came into view a lot more clearly. Although it was hunched over and squatting, it was still pretty huge, almost as tall as I was. It had mangy black fur all over its body, the shape of which was somewhat humanoid. Another loud crunch followed by a chewing sound. The creature tossed a bone sideways in a bemused way, which fell down with a loud clank and started chewing on something else. I was only a few feet away from it now and I slowly took steps sideways, not daring to look away. And then I saw what, or rather who, it was eating. Linda's eyes stared back at me blankly as the creature gnawed on what was left of her leg. I covered my mouth with my hands to stop myself from screaming and continued sidestepping. The creature suddenly stopped chewing and shot its head up, sniffing the air. I stopped moving and held my breath my heart just about ready to burst out of my chest. The creature continued sniffing more vigorously, now swiveling its head left and right. I could just barely make out a nose which resembled a snout, covered in the same fur as the rest of its body. The creature stood frozen for a long moment, listening. I pointed the flare gun at it with trembling hands, ready to pull the trigger. The creature looked back down and continued eating. I lowered my gun and continued stepping away. I was able to put myself at a safe distance to speed up a little bit and sighed in relief when I turned the corner. I leaned on my knees and steadied my breathing, with my heart still pounding in my chest. And then I felt something grab my shoulder and I just about jumped out of my skin. It was Mitch. He was holding his finger up to his mouth in a way to tell me to be quiet. I leaned in and whispered, Where the heck did you guys run off to? And where's Will? I lost him, Mitch said. We were attacked right after we found Amber and... You found her. Mitch shushed me and said, Keep your voice down. Yeah, we found her. What was left of her anyway? She was missing her foot and her arm all the way to the shoulder socket. Poor girl was begging us to end her. You killed her? I asked. I had to, she couldn't move. She was in a lot of pain and there was no way she would survive. Will and I both agreed to do it. Listen, right now we have to find Will and Norton if they're still alive, I suggested. 
No way, we gotta get out of here, Mitch said. That thing is invincible. Will had managed to chase it away with the torch, but it's way too fast and they always come back. I'm not leaving them behind, I said. Mitch stared at me for a while before saying, Fine, let's look for them. Where's the flare gun you picked up? Right here, I raised my hand. Keep it close. We went through the cave, and luckily Mitch had his flashlight, so it was much more convenient than going with the lighter. The cave was practically a maze, and after what felt like hours, we agreed that finding an exit should be our priority. We had just about given up hope when we heard something that sounded like footsteps in the distance. Moreover, it sounded like boots or shoes, which rekindled our hope that it might be Will. I peeked around the corner and saw a person standing in the middle of the cave, pointing his flashlight around. Will, I whispered. He turned around, his eyes wide in fear, until he recognized us and relief had washed over his face. He smiled and we went out to meet him. Oh, thank goodness you're alive, Will said. I've been trying to. Will's sentence was cut off when a big black figure ran right past in front of our noses and took Will along with it. Will screamed as the creature held his neck with its teeth and rapidly jerked him left and right. Mitch ran up to the creature and swung his hatchet hard, embedding it in the creature's back. The creature let go of Will's neck, which was now at an unnatural angle, and screamed out in pain. The entire cave echoed and my ears had started to hurt. Before Mitch could pull the axe out, the creature turned around, grabbing at its back, unable to reach the axe. It then turned its attention to Mitch and with a movement faster than the blink of an eye, swiped its claws across the air. I didn't even realize what happened until I saw Mitch bleeding from his throat and grabbing at his neck. The creature screamed again, revealing a row of sharp teeth. It tackled Mitch and sank its teeth into his neck, biting off a chunk of it and a few of his fingers in the process. All of this happened so fast that I barely had any time to react. Plus, the whole thing put me in a trance. And then the creature looked up at me with glowing eyes, snarling blood dripping from its chin. I pointed the flare gun at the creature and fired. The entire area was immediately illuminated with a bright red color, and the creature screamed even louder, grabbing at its eye which had now lost its glow, flailing its arms furiously. I glanced at the bodies of my fellow passengers. Both of them were now dead. I turned on my heel and I bolted out of there, the screams of that creature following me all the way through the cave. I ran for what felt like hours, tired but never stopping. The thought of meeting my demise like the rest of them filled me with inexplicable fear. After a while, I finally saw moonlight peeking from a crack in the distance, and I hurried up to it. I felt a cold breeze as I got closer, and I squeezed my way through, breathing in fresh air and listening to these soothing sounds of the forest life around me. The scream of the creature echoed from inside the cave once more, this time sounding like a cry of pure anger and although it was distant, I knew that it could change any moment. I stumbled through the woods, always looking over my shoulder and expecting to see the creature either behind or suddenly appearing in front of me. And daylight came soon and I fell to the ground, exhausted, hungry, and thirsty. The adrenaline subsided and I started to feel guilty and ashamed for allowing the other passengers to die like that. I broke down, rocking back and forth and letting my guilt gnaw at me like that for a while. And then I heard something in the distance voices. I couldn't tell what they were saying, but when I looked up, 
I saw a group of people walking around. I called out to them and they immediately approached me, realizing that I was in distress. I tried explaining to them that there was a dangerous predator nearby, but they didn't seem to understand what I was saying. They spoke to me, but I didn't understand their language. I figured they were locals and cried out again in happiness when I realized that I was safe. And that's how I was brought back to civilization. I told the rescue services that going back to the crash site is dangerous, but they ignored me. They dismissed my stories as exaggeration due to trauma, and they continued their search. Not even two days later, the case was closed, and a statement made that there were no survivors. Norton's body was never found, but then again they never found the cave that I mentioned either. I've been plagued by survivor's guilt, nightmares, and PTSD ever since. I would wake up thinking that I feel the presence in my room, quietly watching me and waiting for the moment when I let my guard down. I never go camping and I've never used planes again either, except once two days ago. I'm in a small town right now close to the crash site. The locals here are friendly, but when I ask them about the creature, they suddenly go silent or find an excuse to leave. Others swear the creature that I'm describing is peaceful and that running into it poses no threat. The third portion denies the creature's existence altogether, calling me crazy. All locals share one opinion though. No one should go to the area of the sightings. I don't know what that thing is and I don't care. I have a gun over here and tomorrow I'm going back to the crash site. One way or another, I'm taking that creature down. And did you know that traditional bed sheets can harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat? It can lead to acne, allergies, and stuffy noses. And it's just gross. Miracle Made offers a whole line of self-cleaning, eco-friendly bedding, such as sheets, pillowcases, and comforters that prevent 99% of bacteria. Miracle brand sheets are self-cleaning. These sheets are infused with silver that prevent bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times longer than other sheets. No more gross odors. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice if not nicer than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. Miracle made sheets are also thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long so you get a better sleep every night. Go to trymiracle.com slash mrcreeps to try miracle made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code Mr. Creeps at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash mrcreeps and use the code mrcreeps to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash mrcreeps to treat yourself. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for some wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. With Factor, skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the shopping, prepping, and cleaning up too, while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality that you need. Factors, fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy. Choose from more than 34 weekly, flavor-packed, fresh, and never-frozen meals. 
Plus, Factor also offers calorie conscious options as well. Try delicious, calorie smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. Plus with Factor you can rest assured that you're making a sustainable choice. They offset 100% of their delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for their production sites and offices, and features sustainably sourced seafood in their meals. Head to factormeals.com slash mrcreeps50 and use code mrcreeps50 to get 50% off. That's code mrcreeps50 at factormeals.com slash mrcreeps50 to get 50% off.